Well, I was going to say, uh, getting into society, I was really interested in talking about society because I think I told you, Brian, uh, I've talked to Zeph Daniel, uh, who helped write society, and I know the story of this movie uh, really changed over time. It sort of started in Zeph's mind as a sort of satanic cult story, and he has his own backstory about that and why he wanted to do that type of story. But over time, it devolves into something very different. So how did society come together and how did the story evolve? Because my understanding is it starts out as like a satanic cult slasher and then turns into this insane sort of body horror movie. So here, here is the script that Rick Fry, um, Zeph, or Woody Keith as he is known then, gave to me that we made into society. So if you read this, <laughs> you would see that it's, um, it's a lot different from what the movie was. But what really, what really was there is this paranoid feeling that there's some, some kind of world, some kind of thing going on that we don't know about. And there's an incredible feeling of paranoia from him. I had, I had just spent a year working with Dan O'Bannon, who you might know he directed, uh, he made um, Return of Living Dead. Mm -hmm. and, and I think he um, wrote Alien, right? Alien, wrote Alien. And he was a weirdo, a, a super weirdo. And, um, and I would work with him late at night in, at his house. And we were working on a project called The Men. And it was his idea. It was about a woman that discovers that all men are aliens. Now, this is 1987. Now, today, this movie doesn't really work because we're not so binary in our, in our versions of, um, of sexuality or gender. Mm -hmm. um, but back then, it was really crazy cool, really fun. And um, it was a woman who just discovers this. And, then, and it's very genre, very monster. And she um, and she's um, realizes that her whole idea of what the world is is totally. Um, she's been wrong. Mm -hmm. There's this incredibly weird thing going on. Uh, Dan is Dan O'Bannon. Right when I got some financing for it, um, he backed out, and I was really let down. And I was trying to, you know, I, I felt bad about that. And then Rick Fry came up and gave me this script. And I read it and I went, wow, this has the same paranoia that the men had, except it's about a kid and his, um, and his, his family. And this kid is, and it's inexplicable, especially at the beginning. It's like, what could be going on? too weird and that not only that the kid has got nothing to complain about he's yeah. in the top he's in the top of the food chain he's a beverly hills kid class president sports star everything he has everything going for him and he feels alienated from his parents which i think every adolescent does right everybody at one point goes, I must be adopted. I can't be, I, I can't be the offspring of these weirdos. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that about it, but it kind of, from my point of view, after the buildup, it was, um, it was kind of a blood cult or something. And even at the end, at the end, Bill is still living with his parents. You know? Yeah. It's not, it's not like anything changes. He just kind of goes, oh, my God, how could this be? Now, I know that I know, I, of course, I know Woody very, Woody Zeff very well yeah. and Rick Fry. And I know how it, how it evolved. And, I, and so I'm, I'm very familiar with all that. And I really understand that where it's coming from, from Zeph. I know. I really understand that. It's 
coming from childhood trauma. But what I was looking for was something, I, I just glommed onto it. And then we very, and, and I immediately optioned it and we started working on it. And I, my approach was, I, I thought a couple things. And back then, I must say, I didn't stop to think much. I was younger. I mean, of course, mm -hmm. for, for my first directing, I guess I was um, about almost 40 when I first directed a movie. Um, but the, um, but I was still, I was like, just, I had, I had um, four kids by then. Oh, wow. And I really had to make money. And I had decided to make money making movies. So I was driven. And I, and so when I saw that, I liked it. I had a friend that was making cheap movies. And, and this is when, this is right when the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids thing, when Stuart bailed on that. I mean, he didn't bail he, for health reasons. He, he had to leave it. And all of a sudden I didn't have that. And I, and then the men, Dan O'Bannon bailed out. And I, so I had this, I had a deal where my friend was making movies that they were financed by Japanese investors. Mm -hmm. And the partner was a, um, he was a Brit. They were both Brits, but the partner was a Brit who lived in, in, in Tokyo and was doing, had a family there and was doing business there. So he could, back then the Japanese just had tons of money and they were investing in all kinds of stuff. So he was financing his productions through Japanese money. And they were, um, and so I went to him because I'm more comfortable working with people who own their own businesses, just because mm -hmm. that's the way I am. And I never learned about how the studio system works and stuff. And so I, um, I told them, listen, I've got, the, you know, I own Reanimator. I own Reanimator because I raised the money to pay for it. So I own it. And, um, and I own then the sequel. But instead, I, I, I could have gone to New Line or some studio and said, do you want to do the sequel to Reanimator? Mm -hmm. I'm sure I could have done that. But instead, I went to him and I said, look at, um, I thought at that point I wanted to direct. And I said, I said, look at, I'll make the sequel with you guys, um, but I want it to be two movies, not just one. I want two movies that I'll direct and produce. And um, the reanimator sequel will be the second one. And the reason I did that was because I had uh, <laughs> this um, French, distributor had told me once, he said, you know, most, we all usually say that most first time directors make two movies with their first movie, their first and their last, <laughs> because once you make a movie, now you've got a track record. It's easier to make your first movie than your second one. So this, and all, and also the, you know, of course, there's also this thing about the sophomoric second one, but that's a little different. But the, um, but the point is that I thought, I've never taken a film class. I have, no, the only thing I know about making movies is being on the set and hiring people. And um, who's, it's likely that I'll be terrible as a director. So I want a second chance. So I said, I'll, I wanna make the reanimator sequel as the second one because that's the one they wanted and you have to finance the first one. So that was the deal I made with a company called Wild Street Pictures. And, um, and then we were looking and they had the financing and we were, and I was looking for a movie. So I found uh, So Rick Fry just came up to me. I was coming out of my office and came up and gave me the script. And so I went and looked at it and I said, wow, this is, I've been living in this paranoid world of the men. I, I get this world. I love this world um, where you think that there's something going on you don't know about. And, um, but I didn't like the ending. 
I didn't like the denouement of it. Um, and then the Japanese had asked me, so I started, I started kind of developing it with them in another direction. So what I, what I, when I looked at the script, one thing that stood out, there were a couple of things that stood out to me. One was that it was about, it, there was a strong sense of incest. Mm -hmm. And I had read some horror movie criticism books in which they said that horror movies very often, um, they're really focused on taboos. That, mm -hmm. that things that, you know, the taboos of our society. And, um, and one of the biggest taboos is incest. And a lot, of, a lot of horror movies have stories that are around that because we're dealing with taboos. And that's, that's one that's pretty universal. And um, then the other thing was that this was a movie about a super rich kid. It was all about this Beverly Hills society, which is where Zeph, who used to be Woody Keith, mm -hmm. um, that's where he was from. So he oh, wow. wrote that with a kind of authenticity I could never have written. I, I have no idea about people with a lot of money. I never mm -hmm. had a lot. Of, you know, <laughs> my parents well, didn't have a lot of money. You know, they were immigrants. You know, mm -hmm. um, and so that's not the world. I knew, but he did. He knew that, and he wrote what I considered a satire. I don't think he thought it was a satire. I, I, you could ask him, but I, I think with him, it was almost like a, um, I think it was more like a therapy type of thing that he was story writing. And, and just to clarify, something else. to clarify, so Woody Keith or Zeph, he co-wrote this with Rick Fry. So the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I would say, yeah, of course, but I always say Zeph Woody, they, Rick Fry was a very important element of this, but the, but the, the inspiration of it, the core of it, the nugget of it came from Rick Fry was this egghead physicist guy that worked for you know, as an engineer, he was, he was, um, he has no idea about rich people. <laughs> so obviously, so, but that's the way, that's the way movies are made and scripts are made and stories are made. It's you, your collaborators, everybody brings somebody, something to the table. I could never have brought the I mean, I, that story, I, I, and I, a story about a, a rich kid in Beverly Hills, it's all paranoid and stuff. You know, I'd driven through Beverly Hills. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, I never knew rich people or people who were elite or something like that. I, 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 I mean, I met working in the movie business, I'd certainly met people who have become really, really wealthy and very famous. And I've met people who do have a lot of money because you start bumping into some kind of financing things, but not as my, you know, and I've met, and I've worked, you know, I've worked internationally a lot. I've made, I think as many movies in other countries as here. And when you travel like that, you do tend to, all of a sudden be, be because you're the, the outsider, the foreigner, the American, you start being involved with political people that are, you know, high up and people who are just wealthy mm -hmm. because you're from the outside. But in this country, I would never know, but you know, I don't know. I don't hang out with people who have a lot of money. I mean, I'm sure some people think I do, you know, <laughs> But you know what I'm talking yeah. about. I'm talking about about and 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 plus you can see in the movie society what my what my opinion is anyway. I was going to ask. I'm not that. talking about nouveau riche. You're talking it's, about I'm old. Talking about, I'm talking about the real capital that that 
I don't know. I'm not. I don't want to say runs the country. You can say runs the country. But that 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 is the system. It in influences. Some way. And the you're system. talking, and the, we're talking about. I mean, yeah. I believe that, right? Yeah. And I believe it because when I was a kid, I read everything. You know, mm. not just horror stuff, but I read lots of political stuff when I was a kid in the fifties and sixties, and. So I've read all the um, all the, the the all the political kind of theory or I don't know theories or diatribes and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I lived through Johnson or Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Nixon. Carter, Carter, Reagan, Reagan Newt Gingrich, you know, I- all that stuff. And I see that the um, and so I've also I was kind of in the in the countercultural type of leftist I, political I thing, and I really and I kind of internalized a lot of it, right? Because I not that I agree not that I agreed with the extreme part of it, mm-hmm. but you just um, you kind of you get the get the message. Yeah, so you you I really see, see it, in in the movie society. I mean you really drive home the po- point of the reality of class. I mean, I remember you even have one character that says, I think to the Bill Whitney character, you know, we've always been sh- sucking off pores like you or whatever. Low, yeah. Low class shit like you. Right. And so one of the, when we released the movie, I wanted him to put on the poster, a true story. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's like it, what they always say about they live, you. right. You know, it's like a documentary. <laughs> Yeah, well, we, they're yeah. They live was more about about how media kind of brainwashes us, mm-hmm. right? I mean, this was I didn't. I was just riffing off of the script I got. So the script I got already had a strong. It was about rich people, mm-hmm. and. I I don't think the script ever really took that as an issue, but I just thought that would be a fun thing to do. So when I saw that, I thought, you know what? I want I I'd like to have a different monster because I'm a horror guy, mm-hmm. and you got the werewolf, and you got this, and you got and you've got San, Santeria, and you've got ghosts, and, and I thought, wow. I grew up during that tumultuous leftist <laughs> time, and I thought, here's the perfect opportunity to make to do something different. And then the other part of it was that the, the idea that his parents, he was really from a different world from his parents. And I thought that the um, that the that he would, you know, he's a disaffected youth. Mm-hmm. He, I think, he, in the in the original script, he's like adopted. He's not their kid. Um, and I thought that um, the idea that you know, I tried to think at that time in the eighties, we were. I always been really into special effects, and and that was the time which which I call the invasion of the rubber guys in L.A. <laughs> they were just making cooler, weirder sculptures out of foam latex and all these rubber, all these kind of plastics. And, and every Nightmare on Elm Street movie that came out, they would have more cool, weird crap, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know Rob Bottin and Tom Savini. Tom Savini was more of a gore guy. But, you know, all, you know, uh, the howling and the, the thing and Nightmare on Elm Street. And they just it kept doing cooler and cooler makeup and puppetry effects. And I was really into it. And, and this is pre-digital, of course. And I thought, I remember once I got that script, and I said, I'm going to do this and told my guys. And so we started moving forward. I, we, you know, I had optioned it. I was working with the writers. And I just lay in bed at night and think, what would I like to see in a movie that I haven't seen? And I thought, well, I'd like to see flesh melding together. So I started imagining this idea because that would be an effect I hadn't seen. It would be really kind of a horror effect and kind of cool and very surrealistic. 
And so then around that, so then I started speaking with Zeph slash Woody and Rick Fry, and we started trying to develop the, the, the class concept and bring the, the, um, the taboo, the incest more into the foreground. And, and we, and at that time, the Japanese had asked me to meet with Screaming Mad George, who's a Japanese mm-hmm. ex. He had a punk band. And yeah, he's part of the whole punk noise York. scene. Yeah. 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 And so his name, his name was Joe, his name is, he was born Joe Gitami. And he went to New York and had a punk band called The Mad. And it was an art punk band. And then, because he's an artist, basically. And then he really liked Screaming Jay Hawkins. So he gave himself the name Screaming Mad George. <laughs> and he is a real weird guy, right? Because he, back then, he wore, he had blonde hair with colors and wore a lot of makeup. And he wore like Kung Fu boots you know, where the tones are separate and stuff. And mm-hmm. more, and he was into martial arts. And so, but I went to see him because he's Japanese. The financer said, this might help us in Japan with the movie if we have him involved. And so I went to meet him and I'm a real art guy and I'm really into surrealism. And uh, for example, with, with, um, with From Beyond, the first poster I came up with for From Beyond, I think it can still be found. I based it on a Salvador Dali painting. Um, and, and so George was really into Dali. So I went to his place and he had all these cool paintings, very surrealistic dali paintings. And he, he was really into, into um, like visual contradictions you know like like um like you know simulacrum and and weird um kind of visual things and so we sat down and started talking about what by that time we were calling the shunting and i think the name of because i wanted to have a big a big scene at the end i wanted a big i always had this feeling that movies should end with a big blowout and um and that I, I have realized that the reason I do is because when I was a kid, I saw the Ten Commandments, Cecil B. DeMille, mm-hmm. and at the end they have this huge orgy with the golden calf, which was really sexual for being a family film for a little kid. And I just, it really affected me. And I just feel like I always felt like movies should end like that with just some weird orgiastic horror and so to have this big ending i um by that time we had I, with rick and woody slash Zap, we had been we had been working on that idea and i forget who it was that came up with the name shunting i think it might have been woody um and so by that time we were calling it the shunting and then I went to George and I said, I have this idea about the flesh melding and stuff. And boom, 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 we were looking at Salvador Dali paintings, picking out certain ones to take elements from. And I think within a week or 10 days, he had, he had little maquette sculptures made and he went to town on it. And in fact, this is the movie, this is the best representation of society, the shunting the best representation of George's art, I think, that there is. I mean, it was the one time his stuff really fit the movie, you know? <laughs> yeah, because I was...